Hey everyone, welcome to week 65. Today is day three, today is Wednesday. This is our third day on our compressed week. And what we've done is just a few exercises to see how a painting is sort of modified when we decide to, perhaps not in all the painting, but in instances of the painting, work in a smaller value scale. So we'll see how we're gonna do today. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is Wednesday, this is day three. This is our third day of our compressed week. And throughout this week, what we're gonna do is try to explore manners in which we can reinterpret the value scale in order to concentrate on the whole of the painting or areas of the painting and subject them to a very narrow value scale. There is an inherent sacrifice that happens when we do that. We are going to consciously let go of the instrument that is contrast by value. We're not gonna be able to use that tool when we are going to construct our image. That means that we're not going to be able to fully explore the range of possibilities that are available to us when we paint with a broad value scale, but that doesn't mean that value is not gonna play a role in our painting. It's actually quite the opposite. Because we are deliberately deciding to not be faithful to nature in the sense that we're not going to try and translate one-to-one -one the value relationships that we see in nature, but we are going to reorganize those relationships. We are going to build a new puzzle with the remaining pieces that we have when we take out the pieces that have to do with contrast. It's actually a really, really interesting challenge because when you liberate yourself from the rule set that is inherent to that which we observe every single day, we realize that painting starts to have a lot to do with us. I've always believed that we have to remind ourselves when we paint that we are an integral part of this process. And what I mean by that is that when we are painting from life, we can be painting from the model or we can be painting plain air, or we could have set a still life right in front of us, we many times believe that our subject matter and being faithful to the nature of that subject matter is our only goal. So if we're painting a particular person, likeness is absolutely key. Many times we don't really notice it, but we become subjected to nature. We are just there to pick a moment of nature, but nature is telling us what to do. And we are just like a tool of nature. And while I think that what happens in those instances is a celebration of nature, and of course that celebration is done through painting, it almost takes the painter out of the equation. There is not much that can be said about the painter if you only want to focus on nature, if you only want to focus on the subject matter that you've picked from nature. And of course, the artist is relevant there because they were the ones that picked that particular subject matter, that particular instance of nature, and that choice speaks about the artists themselves. But I think we can go further I've always talked about how nature can be our starting point, how it is only there to provide us with a spark. It is the catalyst for the painting exercise. But I don't know if it should always be the goal. There is this impulse to try and grasp this small moment of nature, and we are desperately trying through painting to speak about that tiny little instance that fascinated us. So in those situations, if we can be very faithful to what we are understanding to be fascinating about that tiny little expression of nature, then yeah, we, we have to have the ability to be faithful. The same goes when painting a portrait. If there is something that fascinates us about a particular person, a particular human being, and we want to speak about the specificities of that human being, we have to be capable of faithfully translating all of that information into painting. So I do think that we have to have that in our tool belt. We have to be capable of producing a painting that echoes the essence, the nature of what we are looking. We can't just shield ourselves into saying, well, I want to be expressive. I want to speak about how I feel. 
and not so much about the subject matter. Hopefully, if we say those things, we are not just hiding behind the fact that we chose expression because we failed at representation, because we were initially tempted to do something that was naturalist, that was trying to be faithful to what we were looking at, but our ability or our experience betrayed us, and we realized that we didn't have enough to produce the painting that we initially wanted to produce. So we have to be very honest with ourselves there. I think the best scenario here is knowing that should we want to do something like that, we have the ability to be able to summon that discipline to portray nature as we see it. But there has to be an effort to also understand ourselves as a very important part of this equation, which means that all this information that nature is sending our way has to be filtered through us before it gets translated into painting. And in that filtering process, wonderful things can happen. Absolutely beautiful things can happen. And I think that that is the most interesting aspect of painting. Because if not, and I've been given this a lot of thought, a lot of times you see people venerating certain artists and expressing how much they think that the way they work is the way that painting should be. And while I understand the sentiment behind that, sometimes I think, do people actually believe that? I wonder if people realize what they are expressing when they state something like that. Now, would they want every single painter to paint that way? At the end, painting would suddenly become finite. It would just be a single road. It would be a road wide enough so that millions of painters around the world could walk in it, but it would just be one road. And I think that that's terrible. I think that when somebody does something beautiful, yeah, we can celebrate it, but we deep down shouldn't want to believe that that is the way that painting should be done because that's horrible. <laughs> I mean, that would be dystopia for me. If I would go to a museum and if I could feel the same energy, the same hand, the same values exalted through painting in every single painting that was there, I would die. I wouldn't want to ever see painting again. So I do think that we have to understand that, sure, there's, you know, amazing painters out there that paint beautiful paintings, but that doesn't mean that everyone has to paint that way. We should just be happy that they paint in that way and we have to celebrate it. And then we have to look further. We have to start looking for other people that can paint in other wonderful ways and that expand our definition of painting. And I think that that's super important. I'm not saying that this particular exercise is the way to achieve one of the ways in which, you know, painting can be re-signified. No, not at all. I mean, this is just a very, very basic, very simple exercise. But what I'm trying to say through the exercise, perhaps, is that, you know, painters have to find ways in which they can understand the sort of painters that they are. We have to put ourselves in conditions in paintings that push us, that obligate us to understand that we have to be a part of our painting, that there is a role to be played by the painter. There is a responsibility to be had by the painter. And we can't shy away from that responsibility. And one of the ways in which we shy away from it is just relying entirely on nature and saying, well, it looks like that in nature, so that's what I'm doing. And you wash your hands and you just say, well, it was beautiful there and I translated it beautifully, so I'm done. My job is just to point at nature and that's it. Or we start working in manners that are not our own. You know, we start doing paintings that don't belong to us in the sense that we spot things that work in other people's paintings and we try to impose them onto our paintings. We tack them onto our paintings. And if we do that enough, there's going to be a time where we start believing that that is our own painting, that this Frankenstein bit of painting is actually this beautiful thing that we created. So we have to be very careful to not be uh, complacent about what we do. And we push ourselves constantly. And one of the ways in which I've found that we can push is to be open, like truly open to many manners of painting. Now, while I was doing today's painting of Fed, opening up this door, I realized that 
it reminded me, not an execution, but there was something that reminded me. There was an eerie quality that reminded me of Walter Sickert. I was reading and I actually didn't know that he was of German descent, but I don't see a lot of German late 19th century, uh, early 20th century painting in what he's doing. I think it's very, very British. I've always been fascinated by Sickert because ah, I don't know how else to express this. I think there's an ugliness to his painting that I find really, really attractive. And that sounds kind of weird, right? Because I don't find the painting repelling. I don't find I reject his paintings. You know, when I say that the paintings are ugly, it doesn't mean that I have to look away. No, not at all. I'm actually fascinated by the paintings because when I see that there is this ugliness, and again, forgive me, I don't have any other word to express how I feel about his work, but when I realize that there's something off about them, but I still want to look further, I want to dive deeper into the painting, that's when I realize, wow, there's something to these paintings because that is, I think, the mark of a great piece of art. The fact that it can make you feel one way, but it can still draw your attention. You're being challenged by the work of art. Now, this is not as gruesome or as morbid as us being fascinated by, you know, a car accident, for example. No, no, no. I don't think that that's what's happening with Sickert's paintings. But I have this feeling, and let me see if I can describe it. I've gone to musicals and theater shows where many times I'm in the front row and I'm actually way too close to all the actors and the scenery that's there. And because you're too close, the illusion is really hard to maintain because when you're close, you see everything that's flawed about the scenery or how banged up it is or how kind of cheap the costumes are and how they're not fitted. You see all the wrinkles in the presentation that you're not really supposed to see because you're supposed to be farther back for that illusion to take place. So I remember just being distracted by all the realness of things. I feel that that's kind of what happens with Sickert's paintings. It's almost as if you were coming into this dimly lit room, and a lot of his paintings are dimly lit, so I'm not trying to be literal about this uh, metaphor, but it's almost as if you're going into this dimly lit room and everything seems fine, and then all of a sudden, somebody just turns on all the lights, and for a second, for a split second, you get to see what everything actually looks like. And it takes you away from that experience. And when the lights are turned off again, you're almost like wishing that you had never seen what things actually look like with the lights turned on. You have to almost like juggle those two realities from then on when you're looking at that painting. I think that that's what happens with Sickert. It's almost like I know how ugly things are when you turn on the lights. And I'm fascinated by that. It is a very weird feeling that you get, and I regret that I know what things actually look like, but for some reason, I'm still there. I'm hooked. You know, I'm still engaged with the paintings. I don't know if that made sense at all, <laughs> but I think that's the closest that I can describe how I feel about Sickert's work, and I love his work. To me, it's almost as if Bonnard had a baby with a sewer. You know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I know that doesn't make sense, but there is something weird about Sickert. I can totally see why people thought that he could be Jack the Ripper or his accomplice because there is something dark there. I can sense it. I can sense it. So it's very strange to say that this painting of Fed, one of the people that I'm most fond of in the world and that provides my life with light and beauty, it's very weird that a painting of Fed can remind me of such a brooding atmosphere, but it does. And I actually kind of like that. I like that Fed can provide me with that feeling because I think that's the reason us human beings are fascinating. I think it's awfully reductive when we say, oh, this person is beautiful, so I have to do a beautiful painting of them. And when people look at the painting, all they're going to see is beauty. It started with beauty, I painted beauty, and beauty was successfully communicated to people. Oh, I would want to die. If that is the sole goal of painting, even when we see something that's beautiful, ugh, shoot me now. I don't want to paint. I don't want to live in a world where painting or art could be that simple. I think we human beings are incredibly complex. 
So if I can see something dark and find a strange way in which I'm reminded of that through a painting, then that's amazing. That doesn't make my daughter less beautiful. If anything, I'm just even more fascinated by her and more enchanted by her. So I think that when we have the ability to tap into those qualities in painting, oh, we should be grateful because that's an amazing, amazing thing. And I think that's sickered for me. I just can't look away. I find so many things wrong when I look at the painting and yet I'm still there saying what an incredibly awful painting. <laughs> I'm telling you, ugly paintings are sexy. Ugly sexy. <laughs> That's going to be it for today. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Love you. Bye.